First bill before the committee is Senate File 534. Since I'm the chief author, I'm going to ask Senator Goodwin, our vice chair, to uh, take over the bill. Senator Lance, Senate, Senate File 534. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, Senate File 534 would eliminate the uh, statute of limitations for bringing an action relating to sexual abuse um, against either a perpetrator or um, an institution um, that is uh, connected to the occurrence of the sexual abuse. Uh, there's a um, under current law, as it has been uh, established in statute and uh, determined by uh, the courts in Minnesota, um, if you are a victim, a child victim of sexual abuse, um, you have basically until the age of 24 uh, to bring a lawsuit uh, seeking uh, justice uh, in response to that. And the reason uh, for that is the standard six-year statute of limitations applies except to those who are not adults. Uh, so the six-year statute of limitations would start to run when you turn 18, and then you'd have until the age of 24. If you're an adult under current law, uh, when the abuse occurs, meaning age 18 or older, the six-year statute will run uh, as it ordinarily does from the time of the incident. <coughs> so the, uh, the main purpose uh, of this a proposal is to recognize the unique nature of the, of the harm, of the incident that causes the harm, um, and of the inability of the victim to be in a position to either recognize the harm that was done, to recognize the unlawfulness of the conduct, and then also to be uh, emotionally, psychologically capable of not only revealing the occurrence of the incident to others, but also to be willing to go uh, into a, a, a public litigation forum and seek uh, justice um, for that uh, harm, um, and to recognize the harm that was done. Um, it, is, uh, it has been well documented. Um, over decades of experience and research that child victims of this kind of uh, abuse, uh, sexual abuse of, of people of 4, 5, 12, 13 years old, um, that uh, when it occurs they're told there's, there's nothing wrong with it, that it's appropriate. They often don't have the critical thinking skills or the maturity to be able to recognize um, that it's inappropriate. Um, often they they may repress the memory um, as they move on from the experience, um, or they may be shamed and embarrassed um, about it having occurred, even when they're able to recognize that it was wrongful, uh, to the point where they won't even reveal to closest family members, spouses, siblings, parents, that it occurred, let alone um, have the strength to enter into a, a litigation system for uh, accomplishing uh, justice. Uh, so often uh, they don't even reach the point of being able to do that until they are in their 40s or 50s. Um, and this is, this is unfortunately not unusual. Um, it is also unfortunate that they're ever in this position, of course. Uh, but our system of justice demands that we recognize the uniqueness of this kind of an injury and still within our system provide a mechanism for justice to be achieved. Uh, and that is the purpose of this particular uh, legislation that would eliminate altogether the statute of limitations in these kinds of cases. Chair, Senator um, Latz, uh, would it do damage to your bill if we just reinserted the stricken language on lines 124 through 2.2? Um, 
Madam Chair, Senator Limmer, I am going to ask for some assistance from my legal expert on this question so that I don't uh, undo a provision that, that they think is important. There's the man. State your name for the record, please. Members of the committee, my name is Mike Finnegan. I'm an attorney here in St. Paul, Minnesota. I've worked on these cases for the last decade. Uh, to answer your first question, uh, Mr. Senator Limmer, uh, this bill would not in any way change the substantive law or expand the types of damages that are available in child sex abuse cases. The substantive law provides that for any institution or individual to be liable, they have to be the proximate cause of those damages. So it's the same same tie under this bill as it is in current law today. So you couldn't have somebody go in, a victim go in and say, my leg's broken, the sexual abuse caused that. Couldn't happen. The judge would throw it out before it ever got to a jury, and the jury would never, never believe that for one. To answer your first question. The second question was, uh, was with regard to the current language today uh, and what what types of causes of action under the type types that are struck through today both vicarious liability and negligence cases can be brought under the current language um, that's being uh, taken out here and all that this bill does is not wade into the substantive law at all but the common law in minnesota has been developed over the last hundreds of years for negligence responding superior and this doesn't change that at all. It leaves those in place. Madam Chair, am I, I, am I to believe that the new language has really no effect to the stricken language in the, in the bill? The, Mr. Finnegan. Oh. It, I believe that the, the, uh, the language here that's in there right now, Senator, uh, was a part of the delayed discovery statute that had a heightened standard for even getting the delayed discovery statute and was raised the, raised the bar for victims of child sex abuse uh, to get the delayed discovery statute. So they had to show either um, against the perpetrator or an institution that they negligently permitted the abuse. My concern with the, with the negligent uh, permitting the abuse is that that's nowhere in our common law. There's no cause of action for it negligently permitting abuse to occur. The word permitting isn't one of the types of negligence in our state. I think it would be a significant barrier for survivors and could be used against survivors because there's no, no organization. It's going to be very hard for a survivor to prove that an organization permitted the abuse to occur. So, may I inquire? Uh, Senator Lance. Madam Chair, so my understanding is that there was a past effort, it's only 15 years ago, whatever, to change the law, maybe it's 20 years ago, right? um, to make a delayed discovery uh, a statute, um, and that language in subdivision three was part of that change, and subsequently the Supreme Court uh, reviewed that. Uh, am I thinking of the right you history? Are right. Yes. And the Supreme Court rejected um, the delayed discovery um, analysis and, and restored it just to a straight six-year statute of limitations? They did. Mr. They did. Okay, so I think what we're left with is some, is some leftover language from a previous version of the statute of limitations that the Supreme Court has uh, made obsolete. If I'm, if I'm drawing the accurate conclusion there. You are as far as the, what's happening with the delayed discovery statute. You are correct. So the proposed amendment in subdivision three <coughs> would uh, remove the obsolete language and, and replace it with language that is consistent with the, uh, uh, the objective of the legislation, which is to simply uh, establish the amount of time in which a claim could be brought. Am I being accurate there, Mr. Finnegan? Mr. Finnegan? Yes. Yes, you are being accurate. Yes, <coughs> Madam Chair, if I could just ask a couple questions as we have a legal expert here, and I appreciate your testifying, Mr. Finnegan. Is there anywhere else in uh, Minnesota law where, in civil law, where there's 
no bar, time bar? There is. Thank you for the question. And there is. In, in um, murder cases, we have a statute of no statute of limitations. That's criminal law. Civil law. Civil law. Civil law. Civil so, right. action for murder. Civ a civil action based on a murder, which I think is even, there's a, in a murder case, there's almost always a body. They know right away that there's a murder, whereas in child sex abuse, the time when they're abused until the time that somebody realizes that, that the abuse happened, realize that they're damaged by it, is often decades. And so I, I think it's a far more egregious case and far more need for it in child sex abuse than in a murder case. Senator Ortman. Madam Chair, um, so if there were a victim that currently is barred by bringing an action because they passed <laughs> the statute of limitations, um, but we passed this law, will this apply to anyone that previously has already been barred from bringing an action? Mr. Finnegan. Senator, there, there are two, um, two layers to that question. Uh, the first are people who have already brought a lawsuit, and that's been litigated through the court system. And I, I don't know if those are the people that you're talking about. If those are, those people, I think, would have an extremely hard time bringing a case. The people that have never sought justice, never uh, been through the legal process, this bill would apply to them. This bill would help them, give them their day in court. They'd still have to go forward and prove all their case on the merits. It would just mean that they could at least get into court. Senator Hartman. But all the institutions that we talked about could have been relying on the fact that there was a statute of limitations and that was six years. Um, and this would open up those kinds of lawsuits to um, if, if we pass this. The other question I have would be if there is an 80 year old who's never brought a lawsuit but was victimized allegedly at 10 years old, you could bring that lawsuit 70 years later if we pass this. this Senator, it is possible under this that somebody could bring a lawsuit that late. It'd be almost impossible to bring it. And I don't know, I don't know if anybody that would bring that case. But it's an 80-year-old that was abused at that point. There'd be one, if you're going to bring it against the perpetrator, most likely the perpetrator wouldn't be alive. But if the perpetrator was, they could have the, the proof that way against the institution. There wouldn't be any records in that type of a case, and that case would not survive <coughs> summary judgment in our state at all. Um, members, we just um, we really have a lot of bills on the agenda. We already are scheduled for tonight, and I don't want to stop anybody's conversation. But um, we have a couple of other people that would like to ask questions. So, Senator Sharon, let's start with you. Oh, thank you. Um, I know our time is short, but the law is. What I need to be a certain of, because in terms of, I've heard testifiers say that this vicarious liability issue um, is problematic because if a, a civil case is brought against an institution or an agency years ahead, they will not have anybody there, nobody to defend, and no records uh, to be able to defend themselves. <coughs> But when I hear you talk about the standard for vicarious liability, I hear it said that the victim who's bringing the charges has to have some record, has to have some witness, has to have some data other than simply saying this happened to at least even get to, into a courtroom to determine whether or not that agency has some culpability because of their behavior in the abuse. And I need to understand that very clearly because it makes a big difference to me about how I vote on this bill. Senator Lass or Mr. Finkin? Mr. Finkin. Senator, um, you're absolutely correct in your statement that a survivor victim would need to hold an institution accountable under either negligence or vicarious liability would have to have some records or some witness that could show all the elements of each one of those causes of action. It's not enough for those for one survivor to come in and accuse a school, a church, 
that they were abused there and that there's liability. That's not, not the standard in Minnesota under either negligence or vicarious liability. One survivor's testimony alone will not get you past summary judgment. That case to be thrown out. There's also a high probability that that uh, person or an attorney that brought that could be sanctioned for that case. We have protections for that. You have to have more. You have to have evidence of the institution's responsibility and the burden of proof for that is on the victim, on the survivor. And if, and if the if the person bringing the case is has a positive outcome against an agency or an institution, and then there is an assessment of damages, are there is there other language elsewhere that guides how that's how that's determined? How how much the court would apply damages? What the damages would be? Is the law someplace else that guides the court on that? That relates to all damages, all kinds of things. Mr. Yes, Senator, there is. Our, our common law provides for uh, all the elements of damages in these type of cases, and the uh, judge would give those instructions to the jury if it was tried to a jury, and the jury would be required to, to apply those. Senator Dietzik, do you have a question? Um, uh, somewhat along the line, thank you, Madam Chair, it was somewhat along the lines of um, Senator Sheeran, because I I agree with Senator Ortman that we want the, the victims to have their day in court. Um, I also have concerns that would businesses have to hold some of these records, and especially the businesses that don't know, and, and I think there may be some out there that don't know that this person is committing these acts. Um, do they just have to hold then their employment records for you know forever moving forward? Or I, I mean I'm kind of I'm, I'm torn by that because I think it, I mean, I think it is hard, just, so I'm, I'm just kind of torn. Mr. Again. Thank, thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, business does not have to hold their, their records for any set amount of time at all. If there are no records and there are no witnesses, that falls on the victim, on the survivor in our system. They have the burden of proof. They're the ones that need to come forward and show the evidence. If the evidence isn't there, their case does not move forward. Okay, members, are we ready to vote? All in favor say aye. aye. Oh, aye. wait a minute. Uh, there, let me. <clears throat> Earlier, uh, there was someone who testifies that this, this bill would impose forever liabilities uh, that could be imposed at any time. Testifier also said that, they, that this bill would impose liability without fault. And what we have on line 24, uh, the scratching off or the striking of original language that asserts that in order to be applicable, you have to have personal injury established. Now we're taking the personal injury established out. And the way I'm reading this is I think the original testifier that said that this bill would impose liability without fault is correct. And it's just a concept that I'm not getting here. I, usually if someone's going to be, uh, if there is a fault, then they would be liable for damages. If there is no fault, then how would one hold someone accountable to any damage? I'm, that's where I'm missing a linkage here. And uh, without that, I think I'd have to move the stricken language back in the bottom of the page. Maybe you could enlighten me a little bit. Uh, don't we usually have fault in order to award the damages? Isn't that how our system works? He wants to get it in their bed. Perhaps um, Senator Latz is all right with it. We can ask counsel on this question. She has some, some information she could share. Uh, yeah, Madam Chair and Senator Limmer, I think one of the reasons why the current law is worded the way it is, where it talks about personal injury caused by sexual abuse, was because of the underlying statute that actually was intended to make the running of the statute of limitations start when the person made the connection between the injury and the abuse. So that's one reason why that word is in the current. You know, I don't read 
the change as making any difference in terms of the substance of liability. It's not, you know, we say damages product against the person who caused the plaintiff's personal injury, or to know that the injury, um, that it's based on personal injury as opposed to just damages arising out of sexual abuse. I mean, to me, it's saying the same thing. Um, Madam Chair, I really want to vote on a, on a bill of this nature. I really want to vote on a bill that, that I can sink my teeth into. As you know, I'm a co-author on this bill. But I'm hung up on this provision. And um, in order for me to be satisfied, I, I'd like to be able to work on this just a little bit longer. I, yeah. Maybe simply because of my misgivings, uh, I, I would like to suggest that we lay the bill on the table uh, temporarily in order to maybe try and work out something. I know, Senator Lads, that's probably unexpected of me, but, but I really want to work on a bill that I can understand before I vote on it. Um, and debatable motion, Senator. Senator, 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 last explanation that I could find some solace. Now, Chair, I, I'd like to make Thank a comment. I'd like Mr. Finnegan to be able to respond uh, to Senator Limmer, um, even echoing what yeah. Council Pontius said, is that it does not have any substantive impact on the ultimate standards of liability, which was your initial question, Senator. But this is not about the standards of liability. liability. This bill is all about <laughs> the statute of limitations, when the time period starts to run and ends running to be able to bring the lawsuit. It has nothing at all to do with what the ultimate standards for proving liability are. It's not contained in this bill. It's not contained in this section of statute. It would have absolutely no effect um, on those ultimate standards. There would be no one held liable for doing nothing, no one held liable without fault. Um, it doesn't make any changes whatsoever in those standards of liability. Um, the, the current statute is, is an anachronism left over because of a Supreme Court decision that changed the law um, with regard to the running of the statute of limitations. And uh, as Council Pontius explained, um, this clarifies when the statute of limitations begins to run nothing at all to do with what must be proven to win. I ask if Mr. Finnegan could supplement that. I, I would agree Mr. completely. Finnegan. Thank you. I would agree completely with Senator Latz. There are two separate things. There's a time limit that, that defines how much time you have, how many years, what, what's the time period. That part's the procedural, which is what we have here, which is what this the Child Victims Act is. That language that was in there from before, from the delayed discovery statute, was tied to the delayed discovery statute. Once you get past the time limit, the victim still has to prove today all the elements of the cause of action. They have the burden of proof to show vicarious liability. They have the burden of proof to show negligence. This does nothing to change that at all. That said, Madam Chair. Senator Lass. Um, if, if Senator Warren Glimmer is, is not comfortable understanding that explanation at this time. Um, I do wish for the committee to be comfortable on this point. Um, and uh, if there are those who are not comfortable with regard to this particular question and not other aspects of the bill, um, then I will support Senator Limmer's suggestion about laying it on the table until we can get some further understanding or explication of it, if that's his question. Um, but if he is comfortable with the explanation now from uh, three lawyers, whatever it's worth, um, then uh, then I'd ask Come on, yeah, just have a vote on the man's of your pulse. Senator Lads, I appreciate the time. I'd like to take you up on that offer. All right. Then, Madam Chair, I will move to lay the bill on the table. Okay. okay. Senator Lads moves to lay the bill on the table. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed?
motion carries. The bill will be laid on the table.